The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Variety Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericavariety.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Crime Prevention 101. We're so happy you joined us this week. Over the next hour, you'll learn the tips, tricks, and vital information that will help you keep yourself confident and safe. Now, here's your host, Susan Bartlestone. Welcome to Crime Prevention 101, the personal safety radio show with an optimistic perspective on a sober subject. I'm your host, Susan Bartlestone. And I'm so glad that you've joined me today and decided to spend some time with me. You know, I have to tell you, it is my great privilege to spend the next hour with you, helping you keep yourself safe. And what a show I've got for you today. First up, I'm going to be talking with Ron Knight from My Mobile Witness. And My Mobile Witness just happens to be a sponsor of Crime Prevention 101. And I couldn't be more delighted. And In case you haven't heard me speak about My Mobile Witness before, My Mobile Witness is a free service that turns your cell phone into a personal safety device. And I am so honored to be associated with them because I totally believe in this concept and this product. And, you know, this past January was Personal Defense Awareness Month and Stalking Awareness Month, but these topics shouldn't just be focused in one month. So let's make it the beginning of an, a year of awareness of personal defense and stalking safety, and we're going to show you how my bulb of witness fits in with both of these. Then in my second subject, uh, I, I got and I got this uh, the subject uh, for my second segment after watching a, a PBS special titled "A Girl's Life," and I was so moved by what a typical girl might be experiencing in this day and age, safety-wise, that I knew I had to address some of it on the show. So my next guest is cybercrime expert, Harry Aftab, and we're going to talk about cyberbullying. If you're a parent, you must, must, must be aware of this subject, exactly what it is and how to help your child, girl or boy, if it's happening to them. And then I've also got uh, some great uh, tips for you. Uh, Back in the beginning of January, I talked about how to use your brains instead of your muscles if you're you're in a self-defense or personal safety situation. And I got such response to this that I'm going to give you a couple more tips on using strategies if you're in a fight. So grab your paper and pencil. There's a lot of information that you're going to want to jot down. And if you know someone who should be listening who might not be, hey, you know what? Send out a text message about us. Send out an IM. Start tweeting if you're on Twitter. Anything so that they can join us too. All right, let me introduce my first guest, Ron Knight. He is the Chief Security Consultant for My Mobile Witness. And um, Ron has so many credentials, I can't even give you all of them. But just briefly... He is a former FBI special agent specializing in violent crime, white collar crime, and terrorism. He's also, he was also part of the hostage rescue team at the FBI headquarters in Quantico, Virginia. He has um, participated in such high profile cases as the Oklahoma City bombing, the Columbine school shootings in Colorado, and the Texas uh, 7 prison escape. So, Ron, welcome to Crime Prevention 101 again. Thanks, Susan. It's good to talk to you. Yes, Ron and, Ron and I have uh, talked before. That's how I got to know um, the people at My Mobile Witness and Mark Anthony over there. Ron, let's just talk a little bit. I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curve here. Just talk a little bit about your law enforcement and security experience. How many years are we talking about here? 
Well, I retired in uh, at the end of 2007 after 23 years in uh, in the FBI, and as you mentioned, that was largely spent in the investigation of violent crime and high risk uh, apprehensions and uh, and some fairly large cases. So I'm a bit one dimensional in that I can talk about violent crime, but I probably couldn't solve a white collar case for you. <laughs> oh, so you, I thought you were involved with white collar crime. You know, everybody, when they starts off, uh, they get in sort of a smorgasbord, and you have to do a little bit of everything. So I was a gopher in several uh, white-collar cases and actually supervised a fairly large one here in Colorado. But uh, my okay. primary area of expertise was uh, violent crime. So after all of those years, you, you retired. And how did you become involved with My Mobile Witness, and how does it um, address some of the issues that are that deal with crime prevention. Well, I after I retired, I was approached by one of the founders, Scott Bullens, um, who who I knew uh, separately from my job, and he and Mark Anthony had come up with this idea. They were both in the realty business, and they had had an incident or a series of incidents in Western Pennsylvania where female realtors would go meet people at uh, locations they weren't familiar with, and they weren't familiar with the people. So in an attempt to add uh, a little bit of safety to those meetings, they uh, they thought about using a cell phone to take and store images. And uh, from from that experience in western Pennsylvania, they came up with the idea of a secure server that's linked to law enforcement that people can keep what, what Scott calls a security diary that can't be accessed by anybody but law enforcement. And... When they presented it to me as a law enforcement professional, I thought, what a great idea. I can't believe nobody thought of it. And I said, I'll help you guys any way I can. And, and it was free. I didn't charge them a dime. I just said, sure, uh, sign me up, and I'll, I'll get you guys snapped into the people you need to be talking to. It absolutely is an amazing service, and, it, and it, it's a free service, which, is, which I also think is so amazing for the general public. And let's just go through how... My Mobile Witness works. When you you have to sign up for an account. Right. Well, you saw, you go to the website mymobilewitness.com and it'll walk you through a series of steps. It takes about 30 seconds to sign up. You get a password, which is usually your cell phone number and you know another another digit or something at My Mobile Witness, and that becomes your account. And if you find yourself in a situation you want to document and send to your and send to the secure server. You, you just take a picture or send a text. And the important thing here is there's no social aspect to this. It sits in a secure server unless, unless you need it or law enforcement needs it. And you can't go back in and get it out or change it. And if you're in a dicey situation, nobody can take your phone and say, I'm going to erase it. It sits in a server until law enforcement uh, needs it. Now, the server is actually called a fusion center, correct? Well, actually, the server that? is the no. the The fusion center is the link that we have established with local police officers. And one of the early problems was how do you control the distribution of these texts or pictures? And um, after a lot of discussion, a lot of research, we determined that a good way to do it would be to use what's called state fusion centers. And they sprung up in the wake of 9/11, uh, where it was mandated that state, local, and federal law enforcement have a way, a way to share information. Uh, federally funded, and um, what we were looking for is some quality control at the highest level we can find. So you wouldn't ha necessarily have a five-person police department uh, having access to my mobile witness. There's 55,000 police departments, and uh, what we wanted to do was ensure a higher quality of access. And uh, by making the fusion center the points of contact. Um, and giving them access, we require the local police departments to go to these fusion centers in each state or region and ask to get access to the uh, to the uh, secure server. And the way that the local enforcement would know about this is that the person who has been keeping this digital record would go to the police and say, I've got images stored up right. there. That, yep. that I need for um, my stalking case, for example. That's exactly right, yep. Or as in the case of the real estate, um, they, I think that uh, when I would talk to you before, they would take pictures routinely. 
And this is a personal safety issue, right? They they were constantly yeah. exposed to people they didn't know, and they would take these pictures routinely of clients, and they would alert the client, the person that came to look at the house, and this is now going to be stored in the fusion center. Yeah. And if if any legal action needed to be taken because of an action by this person, that record was there, that that person was with them, what time, right? And you, and you can also type a message yep. on there. If you feel it was appropriate to send a, take a picture, you could uh, text a license plate. And, uh, and, and the point I, I'd, I'd like to hit, Susan, is the deterrent value. If things do go sideways on you in a relationship or uh, in the case of the realtor, if... Uh, if they did get into a situation that uh, was was dangerous and uh, and and they had to do something, the the conversation may go something like, "Hey, listen, I it's clear you're not a client, but what you need to know is when I came up here, I took a picture of your license plate and I sent it to my mobile witness, and it's sitting in a server now, and the police are going to pull that picture if anything happens to me. So whatever you're thinking, you're not anonymous." And and the deterrent value is probably the most important aspect of my mobile witness, and it's certainly what pulled me into the uh, into the fold is just being able to get yourself out of a situation before a tragedy occurred. And you, the other the other thing too is, um, and you know, in a worst case scenario where where you're not able to pull that uh, file yourself, you want to make sure that your closest friends and family know that you have or or even on your job if it's if it's job related in terms of like like it being that real estate agent uh someone else knows that you have a my mobile witness account and that way you know they can track back if you've taken any any pictures before you went missing or something like that yeah and that's almost instantaneous they would call the mmw technicians and say is there activity at this account number and if there is and it correlates roughly to the time when the offense uh, occurred. They're going to go right after it. I mean, you've you've created your own your own uh, evidence. And and it's you know when I say evidence, that's worst casing it. Again, the deterrent value uh, is 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 very important in a social situation in a stalking situation. Uh, you started talking about domestic issues. Um, it also it also documents uh, inappropriate behavior. If somebody somebody's under a restraining order and they keep showing up, uh, there's nothing wrong with documenting that, sending it to the server, and then if it does rise to a criminal case, uh, you just turn it over to the investigator and say, on such and such a date, you know, just pull these uh, images, and you'll see that there is a violation of the restraining order. And then you start getting into felonies, and that generally gets people's attention that are trying to harass uh, harass people. I want to just go, go back to that uh, restraining order circumstance because. Most most people, unless they've been in that situation themselves, don't really know this. But you can only arrest somebody for breaking, for violating a restraining order. You right. Just, the, the, That's right. Right. They, just the the fact that you have it isn't isn't protection. The police can do nothing until it's been violated. And having their picture, like let, for example common thing would be this person cannot come within 200 feet of you. Well, if right. you snap the picture that shows he's clearly within 200 feet of you, now you've got the basis for his violation of that order and bringing the law enforcement in on it. Before that, yeah. he could say, no, I was not within 200 feet. And she, she'll say, yes, you were, and he'll say, no, you weren't. And, and, and it's very inconclusive in terms of law enforcement action. But this yeah, it, it takes care of the he said, she said. It, uh, it's date time stamped, and uh, there's really no doubt that there is a violation of the restraining order. And you bring up a good point. A restraining order is an administrative notification to the police that there is a problem, but as you said, you have to violate it uh, in order for something to happen, and some of the violations are, are obviously very tragic. All right, Ron, let's uh, hold here one moment. Now, uh, what am I going to ask my audience to do? I need you to stay tuned because uh, you're going to get all the information you need to increase your personal safety using uh, my mobile witness. And there's plenty of show left to tune in for. So please start tweeting about us.
talk, talk, talk. That's all we do is talk. Yeah! If you'd like to talk, call us toll free right now at 1-866-472-5787. one 472 5787 That's it. That's it. VoiceAmerica.com. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can be prevented. Using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real-life examples and success stories, Susan shows how it's done in her new book, Think Fast and Prevent a Violent Crime, How to Respond to Danger in 20 Seconds or Less. Check out www.crimeprevention.com. Prevention101.com for more information. We all share similar desires to be loved, to be happy, and to feel well. Your inner journey is here to support you, inspire you, and expand your knowledge of you. Tune in for new insights, meet our guests, get the inspiration you need to create the life you really want. Your inner journey with Penny Calcina is about her inner journey and your inner journey and the things that connect us all. Tune in every Monday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific Time for your inner journey on 7th Wave Network. Join G. Cobb in the house every week on the Voice America Sports Channel. This show takes you inside the world of sports from one who knows. Gary Cobb is an 11-year NFL veteran who has almost 20 years in sports radio and television. From the locker room to the clubhouse, we'll talk on the inside with the newsmakers on the sports scene. It's always exciting and full of energy. G. Cobb in the house with Gary Cobb and co-host Micah Warren is broadcast live every Friday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 4 p.m. Pacific on the Voice America Sports Channel. Streaming live, the leader in Internet talk radio, voiceamerica.com. You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. Susan would like to remind you that no absolutes exist in a crime scenario and no advice can possibly address every variable. Each situation should be evaluated individually and responded to in a way you instinctively judge best. It's Susan's aim on this show to provide you with the information and options that will help you make that instinctive assessment quickly and safely. And if you're already a survivor of the kind of crime we're talking about on the show today, or any other crime for that matter, please remember that there are no right or wrong responses in a criminal encounter, and nothing that happened to you was your fault. Even if you think you used bad judgment in a situation and left yourself vulnerable, that's never an excuse for a crime or for violence. So please, call yourself a survivor, not a victim, and understand that with time, distance, and the proper professional help, you can put what happened into perspective and get on with your life. If you'd like to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, send your comments to solutions at fightsafe.com and Susan may address some of them on future shows. That email address again, solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101. Hello, and Susan Bartlestone here. And if you're just tuning in, I'm speaking with Ron Knight from MyMobileWitness.com, and you can find out more information about My Mobile Witness by going to MyMobileWitness.com. And don't worry, though, I'm going to link to it right on my blog site, CrimePrevention101.com, in case you don't have your pencil with you. All right, now, Ron, we were talking about some of the, um, some of the ways that, that you can use my mobile witness. Let's talk about a few more things. Um, <clears throat> you talk about license plates. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, sometimes it's not uh, getting back to the realty model. And I've talked to some realtors that are a little uneasy about taking pictures of a client, you know, to ensure their personal safety, and and they certainly don't want to jeopardize the business relationship that that they've developed. But but they don't know these people, so. There's nothing wrong with taking a picture of someone's license plate, taking a picture of the location you're at, or sending a text message to yourself at My Mobile Witness. And again, you can't read it, but it's going to sit there. And just describe what you're doing. And again, uh, getting back to deterrence, if you if you need to have that conversation, uh, you can, you can have it and say, you know, hey buddy, you're rolling the dice. If you think I'm kidding, you know, you, you you're dead wrong. 
You know, I've, uh, you could even show them uh, the record of activity. You can't get the picture, but you can show on your cell phone. This is where I sent it. And, you know, Susan, after we talked the first time, I did a segment for Fox News in Colorado Springs, and a reporter came up, and we sat down, and um, she wanted to see how easy it was to sign up, so we did a little messing around with the computer. And um, she left, and she said, my my uh, director's called. I've got to go back to Colorado Springs. And the story she was covering was a realtor that had been sexually assaulted in Woodland Park, Colorado. Oh, my when she God. Was, uh, yeah, when she was up in Denver interviewing me. Hmm. Wow. I, I kind of hope that her agency contacted my mobile witness after that. Well, they use it now, but unfortunately there was mm-hmm. a, a, a not a good outcome. And there's one thing that I want to make sure we, we bring up, and this is very clearly stated on my mobilewitness.com website. If you are in an emergency situation, right, Ron, I know you know where I'm yeah. going. Why don't, why don't you... Yeah, sure. This is not well, for my my mobile witness is not a first responder tool. If you are in imminent danger, uh, whether we're talking about uh, restraining orders or sexual assaults or anything that presents a clear and present danger to you at that moment, nine one one is the way to go. My mobile witness is a deterrent. It's a documentation tool. It is not a substitute for nine one one. And chances are, it's not going to scare anybody off. So um, go with the people that can respond to your emergency. And that's the people at 911. Absolutely. So I want to make that very, very clear. Now, the other thing that, because um, I talk about my mobile witness all the time, and people say, how can this possibly be free? And it is. It's free. Right. right the basic, well, yeah, the basic... and I had the same question. And um, the the ultimate, I'm not the business guy, so um, bear with me on this, but um, what, Scott and Mark eventually want to do is establish cor- corporate partnerships. Um, there are corporations that want to be involved with um, with public service sort of uh, gestures, and I've always considered this because it was free, more of a public service than a business. Um, and that's what they're they're after is um, to establish corp- corporate partnerships, sponsorships, and we we talked a little bit about the university model where universities. Um, may have server space where they can use MMW the way they want to use it, uh, tailor it to their own university. The, those those services would would cost money, but uh, to you and I, the average user, it remains free. And, and that's where Mark and Scott are, are going eventually, as far as your question about making money, is mm-hmm. they want to establish port, uh, corporate partnerships and sponsorships uh, for My Mobile Witness. Well, I, I think that, that um, I, I can uh, totally see that happening because it's of such uh, great value to people. And uh, let's, uh, let's just talk really uh, uh, just uh, briefly about um, this university model that's, that's coming up in the future. I mean, I can see tremendous personal safety advantage for having an entire college campus signed up to my mobile witness. Yeah, and, and well, what, whatever the whatever the the logistics of it are, but I mean, right, right around there are just so many situations yeah. that college. Well, the, the universities that are going to start it up, um, Colorado State University, which is has thirty five thousand students, um, they're in the development process now, and they and they want to they want to provide it tailored to their situation up in Fort Collins. Um, they probably will logo it um, in conjunction with MMW and call it something else, whether it was, uh, you know, RAM uh, security or whatever. But th- but they want to use their information conduits to get to the students and enhance security. And I, and I think largely they, they, they're trying to target those young, young teenage girls the first or second year in college um, and provide them something in their toolbox should they stray into some high-risk behavior. And uh, but today, Mark, the reason he's not on the show is down at Emory University talking to them about how they'd, they'd like to do it. it it's, it's a fairly new uh, frontier for them, so they're not exactly sure how it's going to look. The concept remains the same in that you take the, um, you take the image or the text, you send it to a secure server, but in that server is, um, is, is a, a commonality in that 
the pictures in that one section all relate to students or student student activity. And and I, that's maybe a little bit wordy, but I, I hope I hope I got that across to you that it's a little more tailored than just mm-hmm. the, the whole world. I can see so many situations on a on a college campus that you would want to have uh, a record. I mean, I've done a number of programs. We we know, unfortunately, date rape situations things yeah. happen. Um, I did a show not too long ago uh, about. There's a there's a um, a training uh, institute. It's called Bringing in the Bystander. This is something that I want to turn you guys on to to this uh, group because this is something that should be part of their training. And they go around to different colleges and universities, and they tell people how to recognize the signs that somebody might be in danger. Like, for example, if you see uh, your girlfriend has drank too much at a, at a right. college party and somebody's trying to lead her off upstairs, how you can intervene. And I think that um, taking a picture of what's going on while you're intervening would be a tremendous deterrent for this. It's, that's just, just one thing. Then I yeah, I agree see. with you a hundred percent. Especially, especially in your model, where um, not to pick on teenage college girls, but you know, if there's several of them in a bar and one of them's going to leave, um, mm-hmm. take which we pick. tell you not to do. Which, you, which you <laughs> tell them not. But I can tell you, it's a tough audience. I have a I know. I know. And uh, it's it suffices that if I say it, it can't be true. Now that hopefully will change one day, but it's a tough audience to reach and. Uh, I think you're dead on. If you take a picture and the individual knows the picture was taken, hey, if he's on the up and up, it's no problem. Mm-hmm. It becomes a nice little memory. But if he's if he's not, uh, he re- may remember that somebody took his picture, and certainly if it goes to MMW, he's definitely not anonymous, and the police are going to have his picture as soon as it becomes known that, uh, that the young lady didn't return home or, or whatever happened. Exactly right. And this Bringing in the Bystander Program talks about a whole lot of different sexual assault, sexual harassment. Somebody, somebody is harassing you, and uh, you snap that picture. <laughs> that you know, and uh, there's um, there's even a a, a group. Uh, it's a nationwide group, and they they deal with street harassment, and they snap pictures of people that are exposing themselves to them, or you know, uh, making um, nasty remarks to them. And they post it on the, it's called Hollaback, H-O-L-L-A-B-A-C-K, and they're all over the world, really. And they post it on the Hollaback uh, website, which is fine, but they could also post that kind of thing to My Mobile Witness as well. Yeah, that's right. Well, we unfortunately had a case before I retired where a young uh, Air Force First Lieutenant went missing, Um, And one of the items we did find, uh, we have not found her yet, and it's been almost three years now, uh, but the individual that took her was smart enough to throw her cell phone out. So whether she took a picture of him or not, that picture remained uh, in the cell phone, probably erased if she even took it, where that wouldn't happen with MMW. You know, it's gone. He can take your phone. He can erase the picture. He can smash your phone, but... The picture's gone, and the only people who can get at it are law enforcement. And that, and hopefully, um, law enforcement will. This will. I'd like to see my mobile witness kind, that thing that concept becomes so known to law enforcement that that's one of the first places they're going to look if somebody goes missing, or if they're looking for um, witnesses to to something, or you know, looking for evidence to to put a case together. Uh, that they're going to check my mobile witness, and they can they can um, do it without any um, you, you know that you don't have to go to the police and say I'd like you to check it right. If they are investigating a case, they can. Yeah, there has to be, there has to be a case. Nobody can root around in your personal affairs without there being a legitimate law enforcement reason. So as you mentioned earlier, and it's a great point, somebody in your circle of friends or family needs to know that you've got this account because uh, when. Uh, when the police ask, uh, that would be critical to say, you know, she is a MMW um, subscriber, and that's when they'd check to see if there was any activity in that account. 
And if there was, they're going to pull that right up and see what was said, what was uh, what the picture was. But you're right; it has to be um, known that uh, that the person has an MMW account. Well, hopefully that the police will get um, it will become so known that uh, if there's a if there is a crime or a suspected crime, they'll know to go there anyway. I'm 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 kind of hoping we can get the word out about it. Uh, you know, so even if you haven't notified anybody, I mean, I really, this is just such a good idea, and I'm and I'm so delighted to be involved in the, in the little way that I am. And Ron, I, I thank you so much for being in with me uh, here today and talking about this. And my, it's just such a pleasure always speaking to you. Well, thanks, Susan, and I'll uh, I'll talk to you next time. Absolutely, You'll, we'll definitely have you back again. All right, we're getting ready for a little pause briefly. When we come back, you'll find out what you can do if your child or someone you know is being cyberbullied. And I'm also going to talk about some of the things that you can do using your brains instead of your muscles if you're in a fight. So stay tuned. Talk, talk, talk. That's all we do is talk. If you'd like to talk, call us toll-free right now at 1-866-472-5787. 1-866-472-5787. That's it. That's it. VoiceAmerica.com. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can can be prevented using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real life examples and success stories susan shows how it's done in her new book think fast and prevent a violent crime how to respond to danger in 20 seconds or less check out www.crimepreventionone.com for more information Stop wasting time. Get what you want. Live your dream life. The Dream Big Revolution. Imagine having more freedom, better health, more money, happiness. Could your business be more successful? Unless you're living the life you want, you're wasting precious time. Your life is too valuable to waste. Let Leanne Hilgers help you find health, wealth, and happiness. Listen in and live your dream life. Join the Dream Big Revolution. Tune in every Tuesday at noon Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Time, on the seventh wave network never be satisfied let that be a lesson you take away from double time with double d featuring businessman and former nfl star dave duerson we'll talk about the nfl with special focuses on the game itself and double d will take your calls and answer your emails live on the show it's not football 101 but rather an in-depth look in the locker room on the field away from the field and opening up the mind of the player the program will also feature positive messages so tune in to double time with double d thursdays at 3 p.m eastern noon pacific on the voice america sports channel stimulating talk it gets those synapses in the brain firing really fast all the time the number one internet talk station where your opinion counts voiceamerica.com you're listening to crime prevention 101 with susan bartlestone we invite you to share your stories tips or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover and susan will address some of these on future shows send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com that email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com now back to crime prevention 101 with susan bartlestone this is crime prevention 101 Thanks for tuning in today. Don't forget to check out my blog site, CrimePrevention101.com, where you can find out more information about show topics and my wonderful guests, and you can also email me directly from there. Now, I t- I, I'm going to introduce my second guest, and I'm so grateful that she can squeeze me in. We're going to be talking about cyberbullying, and um, her name is Parry Aftab, and I saw her in a PBS spe- uh, special called A Girl's Life. It was just an amazing program. If you, if you can find it on the, uh, the PBS website, I, I hope you will, if you didn't catch it. 
Now, Perry describes herself as a mother, a cyber lawyer, an expert in online privacy and security, cyber crime safety, child advocacy. She's, also, she's an author, she's a consultant, and she's been featured on almost every major media outlet that there is, and uh, including that PBS special. And she's founded a number of Internet organizations that provide help for people uh, who have got Internet problems, including WiredSafety.org, WiredPatrol.org, WiredKids.org, StopCyberBullying.org. Harry, thank you so much for squeezing me in today. Well, I appreciate you inviting me. Now, I I saw you on A Girl's Life uh, talking about cyberbullying. Just quickly, for those people that don't know, what is cyberbullying? Cyberbullying is when one young person uses technology to hurt another. Uh, They can use cell phones, they can use game devices, they can use the Internet, um, and they both have to be minors. If an adult's involved in this, in the same way we don't say if an adult punches you on the street, that they're bullying you. We call that assault and battery. We don't call it cyberbullying when adults are involved. We call that cyber harassment. Okay. So cyberbullying is just between kids, teen- teenagers, high school, preteen, or Second teen- graders. It starts in second grade. Second grade. Oh, my God. And how, what form does cyberbullying take? What, what's kind of a typical cyberbullying thing that people do? Well, it, it, it ranges from somebody stealing your password and stealing your game points or stealing your password and locking you out of your own account or stealing your password and saying nasty things to your friends so they blame you for it to threatening you to reputational attacks. You're fat or you're ugly or you're unpopular or everybody hates you. Um, so there are 67 different ways that you can cyber bully somebody that, and every day that number goes up. Now, the, the special that I saw on cyberbullying, what happened to that young girl, uh, a group of her best friends started sending around um, false messages about her, uh, sending threats to her. Um, she's ugly, she's this, she's that. They sent uh, pictures, uh, compromising pictures, to uh, posted them around on the Internet about her and, and just just terrorized her. And I th- people have committed suicide because of this kind of thing. Oh, they've committed suicide, they've murdered others, and they've committed uh, assaults with a deadly weapon. Sadly, kids are very hurt when they happen, and they're very real. Adults don't understand how much words really can hurt, especially when you're in middle school. And, and these kids t- tend to keep it to themselves and not, and not talk about uh, what's happening because they're they are embarrassed. They're they're horrified. You know, and sometimes the threats can can actually you know, physical threats. Uh, and and in this particular case, it was her good friends that were that were starting these rumors about her. I mean, it's just just well, friends are armed. Friends are armed with your secrets and your hot buttons and uh, your passwords. So it allows them sure. to be more dangerous. And as we remember from growing up ourselves. Um, it's really easy to fall out of friendship. Um, it happens when you are dating or you have a crush on somebody and you um, stop seeing them as well. But uh, it happens, and, it, and it's pretty vicious, and it's ongoing. It's very easy to continue the fight because you don't have to go out in the rain or risk getting punched in the eye. You just click a mouse. Yeah, exactly. It seems very very anonymous. Uh, and I think there's a TV show uh, that's kind of, I don't watch it. It's called Gossip Girl, but I think it's kind of along that model where they, where they just uh, talk about other people. And it seems to me that that's cyberbullying, and yet it's a, it's a very popular TV show. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Sadly, um, the, the media always can, it seems to uh, convey that cyberbullying is a mean girls, which means you're popular and a cheerleader and the one who everybody wants to be. It's um, a tactic used by them. So instead of making it less likely the kids are going to do it, if you're really popular, then you must be a cyber bully, and if you're not, then you must be a victim. But MTV has started a huge new campaign, and I'm on the advisory board for that, and it's called A Thin Line. So you go to athinline.org, and they're going to try to make it very uncool to harass others. Good. Perfect. Now, is, is cyber stalking illegal? Uh, is cyber stalking illegal or cyber bullying illegal? 
I mean, well, I, 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 the problem is these words are used um, pretty interchangeably. And I'm uh, sorry, and I, I meant cyber, yeah, I meant cyberbullying. Is, is cyberbullying illegal? Well, it depends on what you're doing. Certain things are illegal, certain things aren't. If somebody says you're fat online in the same way that if they say you're fat on the street, it's not a crime. Um, it may hurt a lot, but it's not a crime. If they're threatening your life or threatening to hurt others um, or threatening to destroy property or do destroy property, um, they hack into your accounts, uh, that's a crime generally. It depends on the state you're in and whether it falls under the federal cyber stalking statute. But we need to recognize that when you're dealing with teens and minors, that things that would be a crime if you were an adult tend not to be a crime if you just are charged with juvenile delinquency or uh, charges along those lines and generally don't serve jail time. Okay, so it, so it might it might not uh, there might not be any legal remedy, and then you know depending on what happened, maybe you would have that option. Well, there are legal remedies and legal remedies. So you asked if it was a crime. Um, it may not be a crime. But that doesn't mean that in many cases you can't seek redress in court under the civil laws. Um, oh, so good. if somebody's harassing you or defaming you or saying something's not true that damages your reputation, you can go to court and sue somebody for libel, slander, which are combined to make it defamation. You can do it for theft of identity. You can do a lot of different things in civil court when people are hurting you. Okay, great. Interesting. Now, I know you got to run, so really quickly, what can a kid do if they're being cyberbullied? Well, the first thing they need to do is stop, block, and tell. That and that means stop... Means- Stop, don't answer back. You block the person and tell a trusted adult. The reason it has to be an adult, when you're young, uh, you, your adults are the ones you go to and trust, and as you become a teenager, even though they tend not to trust us as well, we're the only ones they know for sure aren't involved in the cyberbullying because their best friends might be uh, posing as the cyberbully. Hmm. You need to block the person or the message, and you need to, to tell a trusted adult. In addition, we tell everyone to take five. It's easy to say stop and don't answer back because you're going to regret what you do or you're going to feed the bully, which is part of the problem. But it's hard to discipline yourself not to launch your counterattack. So what we do is tell them ahead of time, well ahead of time, is to come up with their take five activity. And that is what it is they love to do, Um, playing basketball, eating cookies, baking cookies, taking a nap, beating up their brother, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Um, And then what they need to do is do that for five minutes and pledge that they will before they respond. They need to put down the mouse and walk away from the computer, and that way no one gets hurt. And we find that those two types of activities are very, very helpful. And then the last is the golden rule. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you, whether it's online or offline. Um, and think before you click, because you might be sending that message that your friend understands to the wrong place because you mistyped it, and it ends up in a lawyer's inbox who doesn't understand why you say you're going to kill her uh, because she just got a new dress um, because she's not your 12-year-old playmate. Mm-hmm. So I think we just need to be realistic, and parents need to make sure they're putting the right technology into their kids' hands at the right time and that they're there for these requests. They don't become ballistic. They don't... Uh, um, they don't uh, escalate things too quickly and call the FBI because only 5% of the teens and tweens will tell their parents if they've been cyberbullied. That means you need to be in that 5%. You have to be calm. You have to be the one people trust, and you have to be the one that your kids come to when they need help. And you actually have a tutorial on your website, StopCyberBullying.org, that is for parents. Yeah, we have many things. We have a million-dollar Stop Cyberbullying Toolkit that will be launched next month. It's free for schools with a million dollars' worth of animations and and tutorials and guides and printables and posters and computer games and risk risk management pointers. Um, It's totally free. It's a download. So we're out there trying to make sure that everybody gets what they need, and they can go to StopCyberbullying.org, which is the most popular cyberbullying website on the Internet today. And it's fantastic. That are, every parent should be there. StopCyberBullying.org. Harry, thank you so very much for for giving me some time today. I truly appreciate it. It's a really important topic, and maybe we can talk to you again one of these days. Great. Good luck, and all of the moms out there can follow us on Twitter at Wired Moms. And I'm signing up too. Great. All Thanks right. a lot. Bye bye. All righty. Well, this is Crime Prevention 101. 
We'll be right back, and I've got some things that you can do to use your brains instead of your muscles if you are in a fight. So don't go away. News. Opinion. Your voice counts. Call toll-free 1-866-472-5787. 1-866-472-5787. VoiceAmerica.com. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can be prevented. Using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real-life examples and success stories, Susan shows how it's done in her new book, Think Fast and Prevent a Violent Crime, How to Respond to Danger in 20 Seconds or Less. Check out www.crimeprevention101.com for more information. Money. We love it, we hate it, and everything in between. You can be the master of your life and your own economics. Join Professor Laurie Lamantia each week for the program Making Peace with Money. Laurie will help you realize the power to create fulfillment in your life and shed new light on your money madness. You'll learn how to make peace with money and feel the joy and freedom renewed in your life. Making Peace with Money is broadcast live every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 7 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Business Channel. You've read the books, listened to the CDs, and gone to the workshops to learn spirituality. Now there's a way to help you live it every single day. The Spiritual Workout with Stephen Morrison. Call with any issue at all and Stephen will passionately help you see which of 15 universally spiritual concepts apply to your circumstance and how. Practice every Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern on The Spiritual Workout on 7th Wave Network. It's a practical path to a happier, more peaceful, and richer life experience. Stimulating talk gets those synapses in the brain firing really fast. All the time. The number one Internet talk station where your opinion counts. VoiceAmerica.com You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. We invite you to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, and Susan will address some of these on future shows. Send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com. That email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. This is Susan Bartlestone. And I just want to remind you that Crime Prevention 101 is available on iTunes. You don't have to be at your computer to listen to us. So that was uh, my last guest was Perry Aftab. We were talking about cyberbullying. I uh, really check out stopcyberbullying.org. And if you can get to um, the PBS, uh, often you can go through their website and you can view their shows. Just check out um, a girl's life. It was amazing. Talking about body consciousness to cyberbullying and and everything else that girls are facing. And we really have got to be aware of these things if if you've got a, a little a kid, especially a little girl. Now, <clears throat> just to, to close out the show. Back at the beginning of January, I did a show on self-defense, and I talked also about how to use your brains instead of your muscles, and this is something that I specialize in. So I thought that what I would do, I got a great response to that, and people wanted to hear more of some of these. And what I'm, I'm reading, going to read you some of these stories, it comes from a book called her Wits About Her. And this is a book that came out in 1987. And you can actually, it was edited by Denise Gagnon and Gail Grove. And if, it's not in print, but if you go to Amazon.com, you can get used books. And it, what it is is a compilation of stories of people using everything and all their wits 
and up to and including fighting, but most of them use strategy, common objects in the, in the environment, things like that, yelling. And I'm going to give you one or two of these stories I'm going to read to you. But I, I, if you can get a hold of this book, it's a really good book, Her Wits About Her. Now, the first story is called With the Help of a Houseplant. And this was written by Dr. Marie Steinmetz. And Dr. Steinmetz was a physician in private family practice in a Maryland suburb of Washington, D.C., when this incident occurred. Um, no, I'm sorry, when the incident occurred, she was actually doing a residency in Asheville, North Carolina. And this is what she said. It was a rainy night in the mountains of North Carolina. I had been asleep about an hour when I heard a scratching sound. I thought it was my cat and got up to quiet her down. I took two steps into the living room and was stopped short by the reality of someone climbing into my window. A shadowy figure was outlined by the streetlight outside. I felt a cold wave of terror rise from my toes to my head. My mouth opened and I was surprised to hear a scream come out. I walked closer to the window, still not sure the figure was real, but it was. He was in the window up to his waist. The sound I heard was the window sticking. He couldn't get his body completely inside. He said, I have a knife, be quiet. Every ounce of my being wanted that knife away from me. My hands reached for anything and grabbed the stem of a potted plant in front of the window. I began beating him with the pot and screaming. I soon realized that no one was coming to help me, so I turned into a mad woman. I hit him with everything my hands could grab. He finally pulled himself from the window and started to run away. I stuck my head out the window, cursed at him until I couldn't see him anymore. I remember yelling, don't you ever come back to my place again. Now, this is a perfect example of using strategy. She used a common object that was in her, in her immediate environment, like the potted plant. She yelled, which has the effect of breaking through fear and panic. She yelled and screamed. And she became a mad woman. And this is exactly what you want to do if you have to fight. This is a perfect example. And it takes no martial arts training or self-defense training. It doesn't take uh, big muscles. It just takes that will and that knowledge that you're going to become that mad woman. The next one that I want to read to you is called Calling His Bluff. And it's, a woman, it's uh, by Nancy T. Miller. And Nancy Miller was living in Chicago with her husband and working as an engineer at a TV station when the incident took place. And uh, now she says she lives uh, on a farm in Minnesota. And she says, I lock the doors when I'm home, a practice that astounds my rural, nature, my na rural neighbors. I guess I've lost the it can't happen attitude that I used to have. And that... That is what that will happen to you when when you have a traumatic event. So here's her um, here's her story. I remember that it was cold, an unusually cold day in April. I was wearing my boots and a winter coat, and I had been working on a second shift for two, maybe three months. I guess I thought I was invincible; that nothing could ever happen to me. It was just a few blocks from the subway station to my apartment and I decided to walk it by myself. I was two blocks away from the train station when I heard footsteps behind me, a steady walk that kept pace just a few feet in back of me. I quickened my own gait a little and prayed that my instincts were wrong, but I could feel trouble was coming. As I crossed the next intersection, he joined me. He wasn't a large man, not what you'd call muscular or imposing. In fact, he was hardly taller than I. He tried to start a conversation. I tried to avoid giving any straight answers. 
I, when he asked me a second time where I lived, I just replied, oh, over there. I thought maybe I could talk my way out of this. Maybe I could get close enough to home to get help from someone or maybe from my husband. At the head of an alley, he turned toward me. We're going down there, he said, as he motioned with his left hand. Deep in his pocket, I've got a gun. I tried to reason with him. Look, I've had a long day. I'm not interested, okay? Then I prayed. Oh, Lord, you've got to help me. Then I said something that amazed me. You've got a gun? Okay, let me see it. I don't think you have a gun. Well, he pulled his hand out of his pocket. There was no gun. But he did have a heavy piece of twine, which he whipped around my throat. And he began pulling me into the alley by the the twine, choking me. I couldn't reach him. I couldn't bite, scratch, or hit him. I concentrated on the piece of twine that was biting into my neck. I forced my thumbs underneath it, took a loud breath, which turned out to be a loud, clear scream. It was something he hadn't counted on. Okay, okay, lady, lighten up. I'm leaving. And he walked away. I ran home bruised and scared, but I had won. And that's another example. That yell, that talking, that confronting, all verbal strategy techniques. I'm going to do more on this since everybody really likes it. I want to talk more about those simple things that you can do that do work. But you know what? It's a wrap for now. Never fear, though, because you and I are going to be right here, same time, same channel next week, when I have more stories that demand to be told, more hot crime topics, and, of course, lots of tips and resources for you. It would be a crime not to listen, so stay tuned and stay safe. We hope you got some useful information and inspiration this week on Crime Prevention 101. Susan Bartlestone invites you to join us again next Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific at 8 p.m. Eastern Time here on Voice America. If you want to learn more about Susan's guest, sign up for her newsletter, or find out about upcoming teleseminars and workshops, go to www.crimeprevention101.com today. Have a great week and a safe week.